All right, good afternoon, ladies and gents, and welcome to this monthly market webinar with me, Michael Hewson, and my colleague in Canada, Colin Szynski. He will, he will be joining us shortly. I'm just waiting at the moment for the Philadelphia Fed survey to come out. I'm just doing a quick risk warning as we speak. Um, I think it has actually just come out. Someone's just tweeted 20.7. It actually hasn't come out on the Bloomberg. Yes, it has now. Um, so that's 20.7, which is um, a slight, Im slight improvement on what was being expected. We're expecting a number of 19.8. And that contrasts quite significantly um, with the Empire manufacturing number yesterday, which was extremely disappointing. So make of that um, what you will with respect to where these markets are going next. Obviously, as a result of that, we've seen a significant rebound um, in equity markets. Um, certainly, the FTSE from being 1% lower um, on my Bloomberg is now 0.75% lower. So we've seen a bit of a we've seen a bit of a pullback on the back of that um, Philly Fed number. Certainly, much better than expected. Um, I think expectations have been lowered as a result of that Empire Manufacturing number tomorrow. But I'm, I'm guessing um, a lot of you are basically logging on to this to try and make sense of what the hell is going on at the moment because the volatility that we've seen this week I think compares um, – I was going to say compares quite favorably, but that's probably the wrong choice of words um, – compares – um, to some of the volatility that we saw in 2011 and 2012 at the height of the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. And certainly the moves in equity markets do seem to reflect um, a great deal of jitteriness amongst investors about where we go next. And to be quite honest, it's been a long time since I've seen moves like this. We've, had, we've been in a five-year bull market. Um, every dip has been pretty much bought into. But this time, this time feels different. And Colin and I are going to discuss why. You know, is there any is there potentially any further downside in stocks? Again, it's very very difficult to say. All we can do is look at the charts in front of us. We can look at the price action, and we can come to a decision based on that. Now, U.S. markets are currently lower. We're going to start with them. Um, so I'm going to throw this across to Colin because I know you want to talk to um, the um, you know talk to our delegates about U.S. markets, and you want to start with what, Colin? Uh, I'd like to start with the Dow today, Michael, please. Okay, so I'm going to open this saved Dow chart. And um, this is a weekly chart. If you need me to change it and pull it lower uh, or br break it down a little bit more, Colin, I'm quite happy to do that. Okay, well, let's start here with the, the longer-term perspective, and then, I'm going to, and then we'll flip to a, uh, a shorter-term chart for short-term trading. And I, I think what Michael's put up here uh, pretty much says it all. I mean, we've been going pretty much straight up for the, the last several years, and, and in particularly since the summer of, uh, of 2011. If we look at this long-term chart here, we had a correction in early 2010, and we had a correction in about uh, this time during 2011. It was actually August of 2011. Both of those times coincided with the end of the previous two U.S. QE3, QE programs. So QE1 and QE2 uh, ended, and, and, and what these QE programs are doing is uh, the U.S., basically you have the Fed plowing tons of money into the financial system. The path of least resistance is into the stock market. So with increased money supply, you've got two things. One, it inflates stock prices, and two, it drives down the U.S. dollar. And in both cases, when those were unwound, you had a rally in the U.S. dollar, a 10% plus correction in, you, in global stock markets. What are um, we getting this time around? We've got the, uh, the corrections been kicking in in, uh, in. in the U.S. dollar, we had the big rally already back in August, September. Now, uh, initially, stock markets ignored it. Now we're seeing that, uh, that it's catching up to stock markets as well. So this is a combination of a liquidity correction, a seasonal correction, and, and, and factored in with that the, uh, the troubles that we're seeing in, in Europe, particularly uh, in Germany right now. But just to focus on, on the market here, uh, if we look at, uh, at 2014 in September, we had a higher high on the uh, US 30. We had a lower high and an overbought on the stochastic. So that's a negative divergence. We've actually had a negative divergence kind of growing through much of the year, and this time it, it's, it all seems to finally have come together and actually knocked it down. 
Now, well, yeah, I, think that, I think that's significant in some context because it's not just the Dow that's broken down. It's also been related markets as well. And I think that more Absolutely. than anything has helped drive this, this risk-off scenario that we've been seeing unfold over the past few days. Uh, absolutely. So we're at a point where the markets were overdue for a correction anyways, whether it was overbought, whether it's QE3, whether it's seasonals. There, there were multiple factors saying that, that we were more than ready for a correction. The yellow light has been flashing for months. Uh, the biggest one was the big rally in the U.S. dollar, which said everybody else in, on the currency side was looking at a uh, at staring down the barrel of a much more hawkish Fed. We had the U.S. dollar going up. We had commodities getting crushed. And, and the one thing left was the stock, the one last shoe to fall was the stock market. That's what we're seeing now. So interestingly, this break of 16.310 that, uh, that Michael has shown here on the, on the weekly charts is very significant. And yesterday's action was also interesting. Uh, could we go to a, um, say, a one-hour chart, please, Michael? So a couple of things I wanted to highlight here on this. So we've had the markets in the states getting pounded, 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 and uh, and it took out 16.310. We saw a first wave of selling. Then we saw a second wave of selling when it took out 16,000, the the round number there. And I think what you're seeing is probably you had yesterday multiple waves of stop losses getting hit, and and likely some margin rela related selling as well. So a lot of forced and uh, and automatic liquidations in the market. Um, it just so happened that when the when the beige book came out yesterday afternoon and and basically it was a, a steady state of the course everything's kind of humming along we did get some uh, some short covering and some bargain hunting however this has been contained to uh, on the, on the upside to about 16180 it's still short of that 16310 support level we broke so we're still in the downtrend but if we looked at today's action again that in and around this 15900 we were starting to get some support so it looks like we do have a short term double bottom here we are back above 16,000, but really to see any kind of a, a sign where we would take this as, as a serious rebound, you'd have to clear that 16,190 at a minimum, and really you'd want to see the 16,310. But it looks for now like we're kind of going into a into a into a sideways range for the uh, for the U.S. market could continue today. We can see it getting kicked around on both sides as uh, as data comes out uh, throughout the course of the day. We still have a lot of uh, a lot of numbers and, and there's a lot of big reactions. Uh, Netflix is down over 20 percent today after uh, after it's uh, it missed badly on subscriber numbers and, and earnings. We've got uh, eBay's down uh, just under 5 percent. Even Apple's off a little bit. They've got a uh, another big product launch event coming up later today too. So Lots of news, we'll, we'll lots of action later. right through the day. Okay, I mean that's you know that's absolutely right, Colin. I mean we the break below sixteen thousand three hundred and ten was important, certainly in the context of this particular breakout. But there was also another break that was just as important, and I think the reason we're seeing the rally at the moment is because of a very very big chart point um, that I've got on the S and P five hundred, and that's that can be seen on this chart here. I've drawn a trend line through to 2011 lows. Look where it comes in. We've rebounded right off it. It's That's around about 1825. And that was again the lows that we saw yesterday. So we can see again it's a similar sort of story playing out. We've also got um, the April lows as well, around about the same sort of level. So, so between 1815 and 1825 we've got a significant area of support um, which basically could well act as a short-term base for this particular move down. But um, we saw a very strong rally yesterday, as Colin indicated, into the close. But for me, we weren't able to basically get back above. We weren't basically able to get back above 1875. And that 1875 area, I think for me, is particularly key. Not so much for the S&P, um, but it's, it's, also, it's also the, the, the 200-day moving average. We've closed below the 200-day moving average for the first time since late 2012. Um, and that, for me, is also very, very significant, particularly if you also look at it through the prism of the small cap 2000, because, again, here it's a similar sort of story that we saw on the Dow. The only difference was, look at this breakout, ladies and gents. This, more than anything, is key, and I think it will be key to the future direction of U.S. markets. We broke below 1077, those series of lows on this weekly chart 
this week. We closed below it last at the end of last week. We try, we've tried to get back through it this week on that rally that we saw late last night in the U.S. We failed to do that. So we've seen a strong rebound on the Russell this week, and we can see that, and that's borne out by these daily candles here. Look at that. How important is that level now becoming? So for me, I think, if you're, if you're looking for a leading indicator for a rebound in U.S. markets, I think the small cap is it, the foot soldiers, I think, as you called them in a webinar a month ago, Colin. Uh, yes, absolutely, and, and in particular because the small caps and the momentum plays have been leading this decline. The uh, and uh, and the, we, while the Dow has actually been trailing, it's been lagging, and that that actual breadth that had been showing a it had been the bearer signal on on breadth of the bull market was that the the bullishness was getting contained into a smaller and smaller number of large cap stocks, while, whereas the troops were actually going the other way into into retreat as we've uh, as we've seen here and. Uh, these breakdown points that we that Michael's highlighted here, this one on the uh, on the S and P, and also the one we were showing on the Dow, if these rallies get contained by these breakout points where they can't get back above them, it's it's a confirmation that yes, you've had a trading rebound, but you're not out of the woods until you clear those levels. You're still in the downtrend, and you still have the potential for more weakness. I think you could see weakness flatly continue uh, for the next month. If we, we think about the historical seasonality is that the worst time of the year for the stock market is usually about middle of August to about middle of October. This year, the stock market sell-off started about a month late. It started in mid-September. It easily, we could see the back end of, of, the, of this uh, volatile period for markets push into November. Uh, the reason for that is that we've got, we're into earnings season now. We have the U.S. Uh, Fed meeting at the end of the month where they're going to end QE3. Plus, in the, the first week of November, we've got U.S. midterm elections, so there's there's lots of news uh, in the states that could keep markets choppy and volatile for some time, and that doesn't even uh, begin to cover what uh, what could happen in the rest of the world. Exactly, and Europe obviously is a big concern. I mean, we've got the Asset Quality Review on the 26th of October, and we've got the ECB rate meeting at the beginning of November, and also, obviously, we have non-farm payrolls. Um, at the beginning of November as well. So, um, you know, what's, what's, what's driving European markets? Well, I did a video um, earlier this week on the DAX. Those of you who haven't already seen it, um, I've already missed about a free 400 point move. Um, basically, if we look at the DAX and the breakout that we saw um, at the end of last week, this is a potential head and shoulders reversal, double top, double bottom, whatever you want to call it. It's a big, big level. The fact that we've broken below 9,000, 8,900, what we really need to see happen now on the DAX is for a rebound back above 9,000 to even suggest that the current downside thrust that we're seeing in these markets is currently at an end. Now, we have declined four weeks in a row. Obviously, this is the fourth week. We are on a Thursday. There's still quite a bit of distance to go before we close on Friday. So, you know, I'm not going to say with any conviction that, um, you know, we, we can't go lower, but I'm also not going to say that we can't squeeze all the way back higher again. Equity markets have a habit of doing exactly that, as, um, and we're certainly seeing evidence of the volatility um, in the markets so far, thus far. But I think at a minimum, while we stay below this key re resistance level here, 8,900, then I think we can definitely come all the way back, certainly to 8,000 um, over the course of the next few weeks, but even as low as 7,740. You know, this is a classic reversal pattern. And, you know, certainly while this resistance level holds, then I think there's a very good chance we can see the DAX start to lose a little bit of ground. Um, but in the context of the overall uptrend, ladies and gentlemen, you know, what, we've, what, what we're seeing is a correction is nothing. It's a very, very minor correction. But I think don't underestimate the importance of the break of this level here. It's held throughout 2014 and at the end of 2013. It's gone. It's history. We need to get back above it to stabilize. So that's the DAX. It's around about 8,500 now. Um, certainly potential for us to go to 8,000 in the short to medium term. 
brings me on to the UK 100, unless you want to add something else, Colin. I just wanted to add one quick thing about the context of this correction. This mm. is a normal, healthy correction in the stock markets. Uh, we get these from time to time. Yes, they're, they're rough, and yes, they're you know, from emotionally, but uh, um, they're, they're difficult to, to go through. But they're needed, too. We can't have the markets going straight up forever, or you end up in the kind of imbalances that cause the, the tech crash of 2000 or the housing crash of, of 2008. And, uh, and so these are quite significant, and, and so this is the kind of questions that, uh, you know, that people have been asking me. And one of them is, I've said, well, put this in context. I've said, first of all, reporters, nobody calls me when the Dow goes up 400 points in a day. They all call me when the Dow goes down 400 points in a day. And, uh, and if you're a long-term, if, you, if you've been in the markets for a long time, you've been in a bull market for years. You've had, you've had tons of, of major advances uh, over the last three, four years. And, uh, and so this is a normal correction of that. But the, the, the losses we've seen so far are, as you said, Michael, relative to the gains of the last several years are pretty small. They've been, uh, and even the 2010-2011 the corrections, which, which seemed so major at the time, ended up being speed bumps. Exactly. And again, you see, we're looking at the uh, UK, the FTSE 100 here, and we can see straight away that we touched the low today of 6,070. And that's round about where the 200-week moving average is. So the 200-week moving average, let's look at how important that has been over the course of the last few years. And we can see that it did act as support in 2012. And since then, we haven't really been back that close to it. But also, look at the highs in 2012, look at the lows in 2013, and now look where we are now. So for me, I think even if we do fall further on the, on the FTSE 100, I think the downside should be limited to the 6,000 level, simply because um, it was a significant support and resistance area in the past. So I don't think that the, the bottom is going to fall out of the market, but what I do think is that what, what we've seen so far over the course of the past few days is a market that's very ill at ease with itself. And as such, we're going to get very choppy moves. We could see, a, we could see further losses most definitely on the DAX, quite probably on the FTSE, but I don't think we'll see the bottom fall out of the market. And certainly this risk-off um, this risk off, um, sort of new risk-off sentiment that's coming out, if, it really, if, if investors really were concerned about the bottom falling out of the market, gold would be a hell of a lot higher. Agreed, and, and so what we're into really is, and we're, we, we've seen a lot of this month on the on the daily basis. Last week we had, uh, and particularly in the states, we were running one day up, one day down, and now it's, it seems as though it's been almost uh, tw twice in a day this week where where we're seeing these big reversals. So it is a market that's more favorable to to short-term trading. That there are a lot of reversals, there are opportunities for people on both sides to take advantage of, uh, but at the same time not to get too uh, too in love with uh, with either direction because it, it, things can change very rapidly. So let's look at gold. At the moment, we're in a bit of a short-term uptrend. The big, big level on gold is 1,180. We've tested that on a number of occasions over the past few months and years, and that, for me, is really the, it's, it's the tipping point for a move lower. We can see that from the lows that we saw at the end of 2013. It's been the lows this year, and it was the lows um, as well, again, in mid-2013. So... This particular level is very, very important. Certainly on the dailies, we go all the way back. If you then bring it into the four-hour chart, we're in a short-term uptrend. We are trending higher, but we will run into significant areas of resistance, anywhere near 1250 and 1270. But at the moment, gold looks to be, um, it looks to be in a case of buying the dip at the moment. And while equity markets remain under pressure, and there is uncertainty about um, what the Fed is going to do next, gold is going to remain significantly underpinned. People have been pricing in um, a rise in U.S. interest rates um, sometime in, in the next six to nine months. I don't think now that is particularly likely. And it's that even, even taking into account today's U.S. economic data, um, yes, the industrial production data was good, the Philly Fed was good, weekly jobless claims hit the lowest levels since 2000. But despite that, there is still an awful lot wrong with the U.S. economy as much as there is an awful lot right. Yes, it's the best of a pretty poor bunch, but if anyone thinks that the U.S. economy can continue to improve against the backdrop of a slowing Europe 
a slowing China and a slowing Japan, then they're extremely optimistic because 50% of S&P 500 earnings come from overseas. And given the growth outlook, particularly in Europe, and a slowdown in China and concerns about the Japanese economy, really, I think, f further upside for the S&P 500 could be difficult to attain. Can I add a couple of things there, Michael? Sure. Uh, first of all, going back with the uh, on the S and P earnings and with uh, with the um, I'm sorry with with the U S dollar rally, uh, the U S dollar rally about eight percent about six weeks. That's a massive move for a currency, and uh, and it, one of the things we will probably see that impact is on corporate earnings and guidance going forward because of the the for the S&P 500 companies that are multinationals, their overseas earnings are going to come in at a much lower uh, rate than they were uh, earlier in the year and that people were expecting. So that can be a drag on earnings, uh, absolutely. Uh, the other thing to watch for is, uh, actually, Michael, could you put up crude oil for a second? I can indeed. I'm just bringing it up. I'm just doing a little bit of analysis on euro dollar. I lost okay. my what, WTI or Brent. Oh, uh, WTI, please. Okay. Would be great. Just something else to note here. So we've had WTI drop from about one hundred and five dollars to about eighty dollars in the uh, in the last uh, sorry, uh, say one hundred and five to uh, eighty in the last few weeks. So that's like a twenty percent drop. That is going to work its way into inflation. And and I'm actually finally saw the prices at the pump actually start to go down last weekend. I couldn't believe it, but it's true. And uh, and so that will take away that will ease some of the inflation pressures in the United States as well as uh, as commodity prices have come down so much and uh, and also the rise in the US dollar also takes uh, some of the inflation pressures out of the United States so um, that's one of the Fed's biggest worries has, has always been that you know that things will start to to get out of control as they have in the past this time it looks like inflation will probably stay contained that takes the pressure off the Fed to move on interest rates or one of the things that does because they do have that employment and and dual employment and inflation mandate so employment's going pretty good in Inflation was starting to tick up. Inflation is probably not going to tick up very far with commodity prices crashing like that. I've just been asked about the extreme move in the 10-year Treasury on the U.S., so let's have a quick look at that um, because certainly that was extreme. Um, yeah, we can certainly wow. see that on this daily chart. Um, but I think what this is telling me, you know, lower yields – you know, are, are, are they sustainable? I think what the markets are pricing in is they're pricing in the fact that the Fed's not going to raise rates anytime soon. But having said that, looking at the long shadows on those prices, there's certainly an awful lot of what I would call um, selling interest on U.S. Treasuries um, underneath that 2% level that we saw um, that we saw um, posted not only today but also yesterday. Now. Oh, we're just getting some news flashes hitting the wires. Now, James Bullard, who's an FOMC member, is saying the Fed should consider a delay in ending QE. So that is actually a significant headline. I'm just about to tweet that right now as we speak. It's important to remember that the markets may react to that in a knee-jerk fashion. They may not. Bullard is not a voting member of the FOMC. So it sounds to me as if the Fed, if he speaks for the rest of the Fed, then they are significantly concerned about the global growth prospects. And they certainly did indicate that in the FOMC minutes. So that's something else to consider. You know, what if the Fed um, doesn't actually end its bond buying program um, at the end of this month? What does that mean for stocks then? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's so much to consider. So James Bullard, does he really reflect the, the rest of the views of the FOMC? We've got a whole host of other Fed members due to speak in the next few days. On Friday, we've got Charles Plosser. Um, he, he wants a tightening of monetary policy. So you've got, the, you've got Mr. Bullard on the one side saying de, um, delay the ending of QE. And on the other side, you've got Charles Plosser saying you need to raise interest rates. What is important to remember is that James Bullard is not on the FOMC next year and neither is Charles Plosser. So really, you know, do you really pay attention to what either of them says, given the fact that neither of them will be on the voting committee next year? Tomorrow, we've also got... Um, Esther George speaking, she's fairly hawkish, we've got Lacker and we've got Richard Fisher. So at the moment, 
Fed members, really, keep your gob shut because now markets are coming back. It's an absolute mess and it's very, very difficult to really establish where things are going at the moment. But certainly that statement is certainly just another piece of narrative that really um, traders and investors can do without. Can I just uh, note something here, Michael? Yeah. So since this news has come out, we had uh, just before the uh, that came out, the Dow was down 200 points. It's popped up to being down about 40 points, and now it's down about 50 to 60 points. So we we you, you can see that uh, through this that trading is very skittish right now. People are, are uh, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty and indecision out there, and uh, and we can see significant swings off of uh, off of really any news item that uh, that comes out there. Which brings me to my next point. Don't try and trade for the sake of trading. Trade on levels. Levels is very, very important, I think, in the context of when, when you're looking to trade a particular market. Everyone at the moment is talking euro dollar lower. You know, and I think people think that that's, a fairly easy, that's, a, that's been a fairly easy trade to make. But for me, it's really not about what everyone else thinks. It's basically what the levels are telling you. And for me, I think there's certainly potential, given the volatility that we're seeing at the moment, is that um, the euro dollar at the moment is looking to be a bit of a buy-the-dip trade. And certainly if you draw a trend line through the four-hour chart, that certainly reflects the case. The Fed does not want an inordinately strong dollar. If it does, the, the, the effects of it could actually help bringing um, bringing stock valuations down because of the strength of the dollar hitting forward earnings. So now we're getting the countdown. Will we get QE4? I think the Fed will end its bond buying program, but now we're going to get more splits on the committee with respect to what we do next because the ECB will not do QE. Colin? Uh, yes, we're definitely seeing this, and also I've been seeing a, uh, some strengthening in the in the pound lately uh, as well. I was looking at it trading around 160 uh, earlier in the day. I'm, I'm just in the, so it, yeah, you did. It was trading. It's now above 160 again. And again, yeah, what we're seeing here. See so what we're seeing here. Could this be a descending wedge? It could be if we draw a line through these lows here. We'll knock out that line there. Does that look like a wedge to you, a descending wedge? It certainly wedge? One looks like one that's starting to form and, uh, yeah. and, a, and a, a bullish one too. And, and on top of that, if you look down to the stochastics, mm. you do have a, a positive divergence kicking in finally after it had gotten – I mean, that's a huge oversold through, through August and the first part of September. And uh, I, I mean, I understand there were lots of reasons why the pound declined through the uh, through the summer between the U.S. dollar rally and the and the referendum. But uh, now that those, both of those are kind of subsiding, we are seeing some interest kind of starting to come back uh, come back into the pound. Although uh, technically, I do think it's got some more work to do. But it does look like it's it's getting to the point where it, it seems to be start trying to form a bottom. It just hasn't started to go up yet. But if you see it break out of that wedge, would be quite significant. Um, I guess the question now is, is the, is the uh, Bank of England in a position to start raising rates at the beginning of next year between Europe having problems and the election coming? I think that's doubtful. I don't think that given the weak manufacturing PMIs that we've been seeing, those, those disappointing retail sales numbers, inflation is still outstripping average earnings. Yes, it is at a 10-year low. Um, at 1.2 percent. So why raise rates? People talk about normalization of monetary policy, but what is normalization of monetary policy in an environment where debt levels are still extremely high and even a 25 or 50 basis point rate hike um, could actually cause an awful lot of difficulty to an awful lot of people. So, you know, for me, you know, you can listen to the narrative as much as you like. Certainly the moving averages are crossing over. So momentum is starting to tail off in terms of the pound against the dollar. In terms of the, the current trend, it's still sell the rally, most definitely. But if we break through this downtrend line, then we could well break higher and the dollar could weaken further. And that's no more prevalent than what we've seen play out in dollar yen over the course of the past few days and weeks. Those of you who again saw my videos and watched my videos over the past two weeks will know 
once we broke through this 108 level on dollar yen and we got this key day reversal here yes we got a very very sharp short squeeze back on the back of non-farm payrolls and I think I remember saying at the time didn't I Colin that I would fade this rally um, yes, and leave a stop loss above 110 that is in fact what happened we're now down at 106 and 105 so for me we could get a rally back above 107 to 107.20 but overall certainly this is oversold in terms of the daily chart but on the weekly chart we still have quite a bit of downside trajectory and look at this here this is a bearish engulfing week here we've broken this downward thrust here has ripped out all the stops on the weekly chart We've managed to find support just above the previous highs of 105.50. We did overshoot slightly to 105.20, but certainly we can trade now between 108 and 105 before drifting back towards 104 and 102 over the course of the next few days. And that certainly would get played out if the Fed did show any signs of being more dovish. And maybe what Bullard said is the thin end of the wedge when it comes for a slightly more hawkish Fed. Maybe that particular dynamic and narrative is now dead and buried. Uh, yes, between the, uh, the the rally and the U.S. dollar, I think that it'll ended up doing a lot of the Fed's uh, work for it in terms of uh, in terms of cooling the uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, sentiment about the U.S. economy. Certainly, uh, the driving down commodity prices has taken some of the uh, some of the inflation pressures off, and uh, and now we're starting to see the cooling in the uh, in the stock markets as well, which had been getting pretty frothy. I mean, if when we had the VIX down at uh, down at record low levels and 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 record complacency, that uh, that certainly we've been uh, we've been due for uh, for this for some time. Yeah, Bullard's still speaking on the wires, so you just have to be aware that he's going to move the market. Um, he's just said hard data on the U.S. economy have been good, so why delay end of QE, Mr. Bullard? You know, if, if the U.S. economy is fine, why delay it? You know, he's contradicting himself now. So, and, and this is this is this is basically what what we have to cope with. It's enough to make you go grey and go bald, and I'm doing both. Um, so, ladies and gents, before me and Colin wrap this up, is there anything that you guys want to ask us? Is there anything that you guys or one particular market um, want us to look at that we haven't already covered? Because one of the reasons we do these webinars is so that you guys can ask us questions and hopefully we can give you maybe you know, some sort of idea that maybe you hadn't thought of with respect to a particular currency pair or a particular asset that you're I'm particularly interested in. While we're waiting for questions, could you pull up Apple, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because of course, yeah, we talked about that, didn't we, Apple? So two things with Apple. One is today's another product launch event. They're doing uh, new iPads, new iMacs, and, and who knows what else. Uh, and on Monday night after uh, U.S. markets close, uh, Apple is reporting earnings. So this looks like, uh, and and just as a general, the the um, the, the biggest name in tech. Uh, certainly, Apple is 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 also active off of uh, off of general market trends. So, uh, what have we got here? Uh, early a couple of days ago, we had this uh, short-term uptrend break at uh, at 99. There was a bit of a trend of higher lows. We're now back here, though, testing a, a much more significant trend line in this uh, 95. Uh, 50, 95 to 96 area here. So we'll see if that uh, that starts to get some support. If it fails, you could see that the then those previous support levels that we've been draw that Michael drew this line off of are back down in and around closer to uh, 93, 92.50 say uh, 92.50 to 93 dollars so there is still some room for the downside if apple breaks uh if it does rebound probably first re resistance would be in and around these uh some of these recent lows and yesterday's high the top of that uh, yesterday's uh, the body of yesterday's candle uh, in and around 98 and of course the 100 dollar remains the big round number test for apple yeah, let me just get rid of that. Oh, got rid of them both. Didn't really want to do that. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, I've just been asked about Barclays, so let's have a quick look at that because that's certainly been choppy uh, on the back of uh, what we've seen in recent days. And, ooh, look at this oh nasty little chart that it is. Yeah, I mean, we've got good support roughly pretty much where we are right now. Let me just get a shot of that. Let's get a shot of that. As you can see, I've been asked about Barclays before and I've got some old trend lines on there. So let's just blow this all the way out. Well, this Barclays chart looks very, very interesting indeed. If we just remove that line there and go through here. Yeah, I mean, basically, I think if, if we break below 201 on Barclays, 
then I think the trap door could open because certainly if you look at um, where the market is in terms of stops, if you were along a Barclays, where would you put your stop? You put it right below 200p. So anything with a one handle on it, um, if Barclays breaks down, we could see a significant move lower. While above that, then I, it's still fairly susceptible to a rebound, but certainly in the context of um, these highs and lows, we're still getting lower highs. In the short term, we've just broken this uptrend um, of the last few days. We're still below the 200-week moving average. So overall, sentiment surrounding Barclays is a little bit negative. The 200-day moving average is resistance. Um, if we drop below 200p, then, then we could drop quite sharply. Um, just been asked a question about, are you both still optimistic on the world economy recovery, or is there any region that is dead end for now? Well, I think, you know, the world economy has got an awful lot of problems at the moment. Um, you know, we, we talk about a recovery. It depends what you mean by a recovery. If you mean will China continue to grow, then yes, if you believe the GDP numbers, because essentially, you know, 7% or 6.5% is better than 0%. But will it grow um, as markets expect it to grow? And I think that's really the key. Will Europe grow in any meaningful fashion over the course of the next one to two years? To be honest, no. I really don't see it. I think there are too many structural problems the European politicians are failing to deal with and until such times as they do, and even if they do, um, they still have to basically implement the reforms, and that in itself is going to be painful. So for me in Europe, I don't really see that much of a recovery in the short to medium term. There's still an awful lot of structural problems within Europe, and that, I think that's going to act as a significant drag on the global economy for some time to come. I think Europe is in a debt trap, and until such times as there are restructurings and banks fail and, and they deal with the underlying structural issues, um, that will remain the case for quite some time to come. Um, and have you got anything else to add on that, Colin? I uh, just said I think that what we're seeing, uh, what we've seen over the last two years, is, is with, your, with Europe, is that we, we got all the warning signals a few years back from the, the countries around the, the periphery, whether it was, it was Greece and, and Portugal and Spain and, and Ireland, and, and, and slowly but surely over the last two years, as the problems have been seeping their way into the core of the of the eurozone, with uh, with, with France struggling and, and, and some of the other countries, and, and now what we're finally seeing is it's catching up to Germany. Germany's been the been able to uh, to fly above all of this uh, for quite some time, but now it looks like it's, it's, it's all starting to catch up to them too. Uh, the, the question is, you know, when, it, when it does finally catch up to them, will that be enough to spur them to take more action, uh, that being Germany and France, or is this going to continue to drag on it? It's hard to say. And that's the big thing. I think if anyone says to you they know where the market's going, um, you know, I think, it's, I, think they're, I, think they're, I think they're lying. I, I personally have um, very little clue as to the long-term direction of the markets. What I will say to you is that on current valuations, I will be very surprised if they go aggressively higher. And I've been saying this for quite some time. You know, you can print as much funny money as you like. At the end of the day, um, stock price valuations have to reflect economic fundamentals. The Fed has pumped $4 trillion worth of stimulus into the global economy over the past five years. And where are we? Yeah, the U.S. economy is recovering, the, but look at the participation rate. The participation rate is at a 35-year low. Jobless claims are at 264,000, a 14-year low, but that's probably because a lot of people are giving up claiming. Yes, that's definitely possible. With uh, with uh, and, and and it's been a number of years. I mean, they've had to uh, the, in the U.S. They've had to go back and uh, and continually extend benefits and and extend uh, and extend unemployment benefits because it has been hard for people to uh, to uh, to find work. And actually, let me just while we're talking here, I'm just going to go up and look at the continuing claims, which is a uh, and it's they rose. 2380. They actually rose uh, rose slightly, and that's something also. To uh, to keep an eye on as as well as that uh, yes you're you're seeing probably you know less um, less employment but but that uh, that continuing claims number is still staying fairly high. I've been asked if uh, uh, oil will make a further drop. I'm guessing that you mean Brent and not WTI. If we look at Brent, we can see that we've broken a key support at the 2012 lows, the 2010 highs at $88. 
So for me, yes, Brent can fall further. Um, I think WTI can fall further. I think, certainly think there's potential to see $75 on WTI. I certainly think there's potential to see a similar sort of level on Brent. For how long? That's debatable because at the end of the day, um, the supply and demand dynamics of that could change very, very rapidly. We have an OPEC meeting at the end of November. Um, if you look at the Gulf states, not many of them can actually afford a crude oil price down at these levels. At the moment, what's happening is Saudi Arabia are hoping to squeeze U.S. producers of shale where the break-even price is quite a bit higher. But having said that, even, even the Saudi price of oil is still fairly high in terms of funding their welfare programs. So certainly looking, certainly looking at um, Brent crude, there is potential for further downside, but at some point we're going to get a sharp rebound, and I would certainly be prepared for that in the event that it happens. Right, I've also been asked about... If you Go on, Colin. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, um, unless they unless they they want to start a, a serious price war, at some point, you're, soon you are going to get to two levels where people are going to have to start looking at shutting in production. And that's the key and that's thing. The, uh, and that is the key thing, because when we look at oil at the beginning of the year, that, that people were more worried about uh, about supply disruptions and that there would be a shortfall of supply relative to demand. Now the problem we've got at this time of the year is the uh, the shortfall in demand relative to supply, that supply is held up and demand potential has been slowing with uh, with the economies in Europe uh, and in China. So unless uh, at, at that point then the, the response becomes, do you uh, just say if, if oil prices go way too high, then people cut back on their demand. If they go way too low at some point, people are going to have to start shutting in supply. But where that floor kicks in, and, uh, and as we know, markets always overshoot a little bit. Uh, look at Disney. I, yeah. So I've been just asked about Disney. I'm looking at that at the moment, and that looks fairly bearish at the moment. But we are on a very, very key support line from the 2011 lows. So I think if, you, if, you, if you're looking at Disney, keep an eye on these levels here. It's looking a little bit heavy, um, but overall um, it's still in this uptrend and if we get a rebound in the S&P or the um, Dow, then, then we could see a significant rally in that. One other thing I would say, ladies and gentlemen, is any stock that deviates more than a significant amount away from its 200-week moving average eventually has to correct back to its mean. So and that can happen one of two ways. You either get a very, very sharp drop or you trade sideways for a very, very long time while this line catches up. I don't think we're going to see $90 again on Disney. Best case scenario, we could continue to trade sideways, but overall I think we could well drift lower over the course of the next few trading weeks and probably come back down to around about $70. Being asked about BlackBerry now, I think I'll leave this one for you, Colin, because that's okay. one of your favourites, isn't it? BlackBerry, here we go. Being a Canadian stock, right? Yes. So we Blurry have uh, BlackBerry. Oh, been, oh yes. <laughs> BlackBerry is basically after the big sell-offs of 2012 and uh, and 2013. It, it's basically going sideways. Uh, the company itself is is essentially trying to. Uh, Trying to stabilize, they launched a uh, new a new uh, version of the BlackBerry, the Passport, uh, last month. They're focusing more on the uh, on the corporate market. They've pretty much given up on the uh, on the consumer market. Now, uh, there's obviously two things that drive BlackBerry. One is uh, is how they're doing themselves, and the other is how their competitors are doing. So uh, we had a run here in in August and September into their product uh, announcement. And since then, we've seen the shares retrenching back from 11 to nine. You're you're in a kind of a bit of a trading tra channel here from say that's about 870 up to about 11 and change, 11 and uh, and a bit. And, uh, and so if you fall out the bottom of this, then you start you may start filling in the rest of this gap, and you could see it dropping back. Uh, Easily into that, uh, you could see it drop back into that seven to uh, seven to eight dollar range, where it does look like it's got some pretty good, uh, pretty good support on on BlackBerry. But for the moment, looks like it's stabilizing in this uh, in near nine dollars in this say eight fifty to uh, eight fifty to nine fifty range uh, initially. It lo does look like it's uh, it's starting to level off here, and and we'll be keeping an eye on what's happening with their competitors.
competitors, the Apple earnings are going to be important, uh, not only for BlackBerry, but for this sector, particularly because Samsung put out a profit warning a week or two ago, and, and that's been dragging on the, on the group as well. Interestingly, I believe it was early October, and since then, since Samsung's profit warning, BlackBerry has actually stabilized, which is, is quite intriguing. Definitely, and obviously we have Apple's results later this month as well, and we'll see how well they did in the iPhone 6. The bendy iPhone 6. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gents, going to have to wrap it up there. Hopefully you found that useful. Um, we will be posting this webinar on YouTube for you to listen to it back. Um, but in the meantime, I'd just like to thank you for your patience on what I'm sure is a very, very busy day for all of you. And um, we'll do this same time, same place next month so please feel free to sign up for next month's one as well otherwise colin and i would both like to thank you for your um questions and your attendance yes yeah, thank you and have a great day trading out there